Okay, welcome to the first remote lecture of Physics 3113, Thermal Physics and Statistical Mechanics. Uh, this is our second lecture. And um, today I would like to talk about um, what was called the information theory approach to statistical mechanics. Now, technically this isn't on the syllabus, and I'm certainly not going to have any exam questions uh, on this. But it gives a really interesting and modern sort of background to statistical mechanics and in, in, in particular the ensembles that we'll talk about. And so I wanted to go over it because I really like this approach uh, and it gives you a really simple way to think of things. So as we discussed in the last lecture, conventional statistical mechanics is mainly concerned with the interface between matter and ion and uh, atom level. So what we consider matter is made up of lots and lots of ions or atoms and we want to have some description at this large macroscopic level. States of the system at this lower level are called microstates and uh, the idea is that the higher level many microstates appear indistinguishable. That, that are, there are many many microstates that can contribute to the same macrostate. So the states at the higher level that we're interested in are called macrostates. And so what we are assuming here is that a large system can be described by a small number of macrostate variables. Some of these are independent variables or control parameters, while others are dependent and given by an equation of state. And we'll see some examples of that. You've already seen the examples of an equation of state. But we'll see what that means from a statistical point of view. Dependent variables, of course, will in general fluctuate about the mean value given by this equation of state. But for a large enough system, these fluctuations will be small. So we're going to talk about coin tossing and dice as a heuristic example. That is something that we can kind of understand uh, much more simply than what we'll encounter later in the course. So for example, and we discussed this actually uh, in the first lecture, a dependent state barrel could be big X, the number of heads after n to tosses of a coin. Here, n can be considered to be a control parameter or independent variable. We can control how many times we toss the coin. Another possible control parameter would be the probability that heads will come up in a single toss. That is, p equals one half it in our example of a fair coin. So we consider that a control parameter because we could, you know, go in and fiddle with the coin and weight it on one side, and we could control this probability. But we'll at first we'll assume that this probability is one half and their coin is so-called fair. So the equation of state in this case would be x equals np or x actually what we really mean is the expectation of x equals the number of tosses times the probability of getting heads. So you see n and p are independent variables and x is this dependent variable in this ex example. A microstate would be a particular outcome of the n tosses. So we do this, uh, we, we, we toss the coin n times and we record how many times, uh, precisely how many times we get um, um, capital X, not uh, the average, but how many times we get this. That would be a microstate. And the number of microstates associated with a given microstate will be something like, we'll call this large omega, the multiplicity, it will be n factorial divided by x factorial times the quantity n minus x factorial. So no, we're, we've been using co coin tossing as an example to get used to the concepts. Of course, you know, with coin tossing or dice or examples like this, we could easily observe the microstates. That is, we could just record the outcomes. So it, you know, it seems a bit artificial. In real physical systems, you know, this isn't actually possible or at practical at all. So think, for example, of a simple model for a dielectric or for a magnetic material, for that matter of fact. Um, electric uh, or magnetic dipole can be parallel or anti-parallel to the field. And these dipoles are very microscopic, so we have really no means to observe them individually, uh, nor do we need to if we want to understand the properties of a dielectric or a magnetic material, as you may have learned in, in the course last year. Practically, we only need macrostate variables, and these are polarization or magnetization. And we can understand what happens, for example, in a capacitor containing a dielectric or a solenoid with a magnetic material inside. We don't have to know the price precise configuration of every single dipole. That's the point. So we're going to look at this from 
the examples of coin tossing and dice, just to get used to the ideas. Oh, it, that being said, I mean, in principle, we could measure fluctuations of these macrostate variables, even though the, the magnetization, uh, we have an equation of state which will give us the average magnetization, uh, we could measure these fluctuations. They're very, very small for a large system. So in principle, we could measure them. So let's consider a simple example. It's like a dice. It's a system that has a number of possible states. So we'll label states by I, and they can be 1, 2, 3, up to some R. So typically, a, a, the dice we're used to, the standard one, has six faces. But we'll just assume we have something up to R, some integer R. Now, assume we only had partial knowledge about the actual state. We would represent this by saying there is a probability, PI, that the system is in state I. Well, it's very useful for us to find a measure of the degree of uncertainty associated with these probabilities. We'll call this H. So H depends upon, in principle, upon all the probabilities, that set of PI. And we want to find this measure, which, which gives us a way to, to quantitatively define the uncertainty. So let's imagine each time we prepare the, the system a large number of times. Uh, that is, we throw the dice some capital n times and we look at it, what we get. Well, the law of large numbers tells us that we should get state 1 approximately n times p1 times, state 2 n times p2 times, etc., etc. And so you might think a possible measure of uncertainty would be the number of details to sequentially get exactly this data, which is called the multi multiplicity, which you've seen before. So this multiplicity uh, large omega n is equal to n factorial divided by the products of n uh, pi factorials. So here we're assuming that we precisely got np, uh, in the npi's numbers when, when we count. And so the, we take the logarithm of this multiplicity, log omega n, and we use, uh, we, well, we just write out uh, the denominator, numerator and denominator, and we see it's log n factorial minus the sum over the logs of NPIs, factorials. Well, we would expect something, if, if we had a good measure of uncertainty, we'd expect a few things. One, we'd expect if our dice had more and more faces, that is, R were larger and larger, that this, and this measure of uncertainty should, should get larger as R increases. And in general, it's not so easy to see what that, how that depends for arbitrary P's, PIs, that is, but uh, let's just for the moment suppose that we have a, a fair dice, that is, pi is 1 over r, and that is, it's uniformly distributed. Let's see how, what this measure of uncertainty looks like as we increase r. Well, we can do that quite easily. We take uh, the log of the multiplicity, uh, of multiplicity n, and um, we just write it out. And uh, what we'll do in the second line, so you'll, we'll just ex ex expand that out here. And then in the second line, we'll use Sterling approximation for each of the terms. And you see, when we take the Sterling approximation, I've sort of written it out here, then this simplifies to n log n uh, plus n log r. We've just broken that into two terms, and uh, we've written it out again. And you'll see that this term cancels this term, and this term cancels this term, and all we're left in the end is n log little r. And so for large, in this case, for large R, indeed, the more outcomes we have, the more uncertain is the result. And so that kind of fits what we'd like to have for this measure of uncertainty. But what about for general probabilities, PIs? Well, let's, let's assume this, this multiplicity is a good measure of uncertainty. It's not the only one. And uh, as we said before, we're trying to find some, some measure, we call it H, of the probabilities. And so... Of course, if this multiplicity is a good measure of uncertainty, as we expect, then any function of this um, is, a, is a good measure of uncertainty. I've dropped the subscript large n here. But any, any measure, any function uh, will be suitable, provided that it satisfies a couple of conditions. One, if um, the multiplicity of, say, some system 1 is, is larger than 2, or some outcomes, then, of course, we'd want this uncertainty to be larger. So 
this h of omega should it, it really needs to be a monotonic function of omega. That kind of just makes sense, right? Next, let's consider we had two independent subsystems. And suppose we measured the state of subsystem 1 in 1 times and subsystem 2 in 2 times. Well, the number of possible sequences now of the combined system, of course, is just the product. Uh, so we, omega will write for the, the, the combined system is omega 1 times omega 2. That's just, that's just uh, easy to see. Well, the next thing is kind of important. We'll, we'll limit the choice of these possible functions h by requiring our measure of uncertainty to be, to be the sum of uncertainties associated with the two subsystems. That is, we want h to be an extensive variable. So this uncertainty function h of the combined system, which has multiplicity omega 1 times omega 2, should, should be additive. It should be h of omega 1 plus h of omega 2. That makes it an extensive variable. It, sells, it scales with the size of the system. So that's what we have. Monotonic and it has to be the, the uncertainty has to be the sum uh, of, the, of a combined system has to be the sum of two subsystems. Well that's actually enough to tell us what we should choose for h. That, that's all we need to know. And that can be seen sort of mathematically. We'll go through that. So this completely, these two assumptions completely define our measure of uncertainty. To see this, we'll differentiate this, this equation, this additivity equation, in two different ways. We'll take the derivative of this with respect to omega 1, and we'll see, of course, if we just plug in this here, then the only term that's going to be non-zero is the derivative with respect to omega 1 of the first term. And we do the same thing. We take the derivative with respect to omega 2 of this, uh, plugging it in, and of course all we get, uh, this, the derivative with respect to omega 2 of this will be 0, and all we get is this term. So we have these equations. We also have a kind of chain rule, right? The chain rule that if we take the derivative with respect to omega 1 of this uncertainty function h of the combined system, it has to equal this using the chain rule and so forth with, uh, we, if we take its derivative with respect to omega 2. And so what, what do I mean by chain rule? Just remember what chain rule me, me, means. This is just, just math. Uh, suppose I, what I want to do is the derivative uh, with respect to omega 1 of this function h, which depends on the product of these omega 1 and omega 2. So let's call this product some function z maybe if we want. Uh, it, it's, it's some function of omega 1. Uh, in this case, we'll consider it to be a function of omega-1. It's just omega-2 times omega-1. And so the chain rule tells us when we take a derivative of something like h of some function of omega-1, we multiply by, uh, for example, in this case, f df by omega-1, which in this case is just the constant omega-2. And then we have, you know, dh of, in this case, z dz, right? That's all I mean, but that's, that's how we derive that, in case that confused you. And so we have, also, we have, we have this just from taking the derivative, and we have this kind of relationships that we derive from the chain rule. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that top equation by omega 1 and the other equation by omega 2. Let me just go back here. We're going to, we're going to multiply both sides of this by omega 1, and both, uh, say, you know, over here, omega 1, and this side by omega 2, omega 2 over here, and you see that those sides will be equal if we do that. So, so that means then that we get this relation. Omega 1 times dh by d omega 1 h, which is the multiplicity, sorry, the uncertainty function for just system 1, is related to omega 2 times this derivative of the uncertainty function for omega 2 uh, with respect to omega 2. And so those are equal. And so since the left-hand side of this is independent of omega-2 and the right-hand side over here is in independent, obviously, of omega-1, then these things have to equal some constant. So let's call it C0. And at this point, you know, we can just drop the subscripts because it doesn't matter if we're talking about subsystem 1 or subsystem 2. This is true of this function h of omega. So it's equal to a constant C0. So then we can integrate that 
of course, it's very easy. We just get h of omega is this constant z0 times the logarithm of omega plus some other constant c1. Well, the first thing to do is what, what can we say about c1? Well, if there's no uncertainty, that is, if we know what the outcome is, then this omega has to equal 1, right? And since we take the log, then that means that h of 1 equals 0. So that tells us that this constant c1 is 0. And so we're left with this h of omega, our measure of uncertainty, h, um, is just proportional to the logarithm of omega, and, and we, we choose this constant. Now, this, choice, this constant c0 is kind of arbitrary at this stage. It really just determines a sort of unit of uncertainty. And so for now, we'll just take c0 equal 1. Later on in this uh, lecture, we'll see we can identify h with the entropy, and we'll choose c0 to be the Boltzmann constant, kb. OK. So then we found the uncertainty associated with n repeated realizations of our dice experiment, that is, rolling the dice some large number n times, uh, is basically h of n is log times this multiplicity function omega n. Now, since h, we chose h to be an extensive, let's now define an uncertainty associated with the probability distribution itself. And we'll do that, we'll just say that it's 1 over n times the uncertainty associated with n repetition, repetitions of the experiment. You know, nothing wrong with dividing by some constant, we'll just divide it by n. And so this will give us, for the uncertainty of the probabilities, we'll just plug, we just plug in this uh, multiplicity function omega n that we had a couple slides ago, and, this, and divide by 1 over n. That's what this is. And so, um, and we'll see that we're going to consider really, really, we're, we're going to consider the limit when n goes to infinity. So we only need to eval evaluate this logarithm, or the logarithm of the factorials, that is, to accuracy n, as opposed to actually log n. And that means we can use that simple version of the Sterling formula. Uh, in other words, log n factorial is approximately equal to n log n minus n. And so we'll do that for all these terms. And I'm going to skip with the algebra. There's a bit of algebra involved. But what you'll find then in this h, uh, which is distinguished by h of n by just dividing by 1 over n and taking the limit, um, we find h has this form. It's the negative sum from i equals 1 to r, the number of outcomes of the pi log pi, where pi is the probability of uh, getting result i. So this equation is actually known as Shannon entropy, and it was derived by this Claude Shannon who was working at IBM uh, shortly after the Second World War, and it's generally considered to be a fundamental result of information theory. And there's a lot of interesting things that Shannon did with this. He calculated how much information you could send down some arbitrary channel, um, you, you know, where you had a character set that had R numbers, some things like that. But you'll probably recognize it. It's, a, it's an entropy. Okay, well, what did we do? We showed how to calculate the uncertainty associated with a given probability distribution. That is, we said, okay, if we have this probability distribution, What's the uncertainty associated with that in this large n limit? And, and it just depends upon the probabilities here. So we're given the probabilities, and we've, we can tell what the uncertainty is in that distribution. So every probability distribution, or, or uh, assignment of probabilities over these r uh, outcomes of this, or states of this system, let's say, has an associated uh, uh, uncertainty, uh, which is the Shannon entropy. It's given by this formula. Okay, well, can we, the, the interesting thing is, you, we want to ask ourselves is, can we turn this question around? I mean, how could we find the, the most likely or the most, let's say, reasonable probability distribution just given some information? So we're given some information about the system that's incomplete, and we'd like to say, well, what's the most reasonable choice for the probabilities um, with this information. So, so for example, I mean, it, it, you know, you'd guess right away, okay, um, if I just, if I thought the most reasonable assumption, assumption if I look at uh, my six-sided dice and, you know, it looks like it's constructed sort of uniformly, then, you know, the most reasonable assumption should be that the probability should be 1 over r or 1 over 6 if it's a six-sided dice, right? That's, 
That's kind of, we want to sort of generalize that idea. And it turns out we can actually do this. And we'll do this by applying what's called the principle of least bias. And it states that the most reasonable probability distribution is the one which maximizes the uncertainty, that is the Shannon entropy, subject to the information available. And we'll give some example of that with this simple, uh, well, we'll use the dice to do an example of this. And that way we'll kind of give an idea of how it works before we move on to more, com more complicated things. And the idea also is that if we used a distribution with less uncertainty, we'd be biasing the probabilities by providing some extra information which we don't have. So as an example, as example let's, let's consider the, the, the two-sided dice, that is the coin, right? So let's, let's consider a, coin, a single coin toss, and we'll let uh, P sub H be the probability of heads, and since there's only one other outcome, then 1 minus pH has to be the probability of tails. So the uncertainty in this outcome, we just plug into this formula for the Shannon entropy. H equals minus pH log pH minus and quantity 1 minus pH log quantity 1 minus pH. And so we can, we can differenti differentiate this expression which re re with respect to pH probability heads, and we can find the probability which produces the least bias, that is, it maximizes h. So we take the derivative, we set it equal to zero, and we get this equation, and so you can solve that, and the solution, of course, is probability heads of one half. That is, the probabilities of the two outcomes are equal. No surprise there, but interesting to see that it maximizes this uncertainty. Um, well, of course, we could have done this graphically too, and if you want to plot this uh, Shannon entropy versus the probability P of H, then it looks like this, and of course it has a max at 0.5. Okay, let's go back to our dice where we have not two outcomes, but some number R outcomes. And P of I is the probability of getting the ith outcome. And so we write down the uncertainty, this H function, there it is, here. Now, the PIs can't just take arbitrary values because, you know, they're subject to this constraint of normalization. We want our probabilities to add up to 1, so that's this constraint. So as a first kind of trial, uh, we'll, uh, 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 to illustrate this method, we'll calculate the maxima of this equation here subject to the normalization constraint. And we'll use what's called the method of Lagrange multipliers. So here we take our h function and we add to this other piece here, or this other sum here, lambda over pi. And we'll see that that actually, so, and then we'll choose uh, this lambda, the value of lambda to, to satisfy this constraint, right? Because this equation, just looking at this equation, we could put whatever pi's we want, but we know it has to, to satisfy this constraint. And so if you add this term uh, in the sum, and then we'll see that you can choose lambda to satisfy this constraint. And, and, and we'll consider at the moment this lambda to be arbitrary, and we'll adjust lambda so that the, this is satisfied. That's what I'm saying. So we take the derivatives of this equation here with respect to all the pi's, and each equation gives you something like each, there are, you know, well, there are of them, and they can be labeled by i, so uh, that's what we get. And of course, we see this equation, with this type of constraint, this equation is independent of i. And the solution is simply p of i equals e to the lambda minus 1. And so, and, and so here are the solution, because this is independent of i, the p of i's are all the same. And of course, they have to satisfy the normalization constraint. So we, we know that e to the lambda minus 1 has to be 1 over r. So, they, so we get one. In other words, as we might have expected, the, for this r-sided dice, the, uh, the most uncertain distribution, in, in analogy with our coin example, is pi equals one over r. In other words, if we don't have any reason to believe that any one outcome is more likely than any other, then we must assume that they're equally probable. Well, that that's, sounds really very obvious, but it was just to get used to this uh, idea of Lagrange multiplier. So let's let's try something a little bit more interesting. 
Let's suppose we have a loaded dice. Let's suppose we suspect we have a loaded dice. And, you know, we realize it's not, those are not easy. It, it would be very hard for someone to make a dice that looked, you know, normal and always landed on one side all the time. So that's going to be very, very tough. So we'll consider, we'll say, well, maybe we have a loaded dice, but um, um, we'll consider that uh, that our dice might have some some non-fair average, that is. So if we throw the dice, any numbers one through six, we're considered a six-sided dice, which is a standard one, it might come up. And we'll let P of I be the probability that we get number I. And so this A, which is the average of the face value, that is we multiply the value on the face, I, by this probability in sum, uh, we'll let this, we'll, we'll, we'll call that A. The, the, that if we repeated this, uh, we ro rolled this dice a long time, and we formed this average, we would get A, right? So it's the average value of the face number. So, for example, if the dice is unbiased, then A, of course, is three halves. So you just add these up, uh, if it was unbiased probabilities, and divide by uh, the, the six. Um, so one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, divided by six. Right? Um, but for a loaded dice, we could have some arbitrary A. With uh, A, well, the, the least A could be is 1, and the maximum it could be is 6. Okay, well, suppose by some, some other means or another, we know, we know this average value A, right? Or we suspect, we might not, mo we, we might not know it, 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 but we might expect that that's the... The, the, the least amount of information that we could say is that maybe this dice was built a little strangely that it has some average value um, and that average value is not three and a half it's it's something slightly or maybe some other number right that's kind of a basic assumption that doesn't complicate things much so the question we want to ask ourselves then is Suppose we know the average value, or, or, or we suspect that that characterizes our system. How would we modify these probabilities uh, to incorporate this information? How, they, they can't be 1 over 6 anymore, right? So we'll use this, we'll use this uh, uh, um, Lagrange multiplier method. And we'll see that if we introduce another, here's the one from normalization that we had before. We'll introduce this other. Uh, term here in the sum, I times beta. And the idea is we'll get, if we maximize this thing, suspect, um, 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 we'll, we'll maximize this with respect to beta and lambda, we'll find, uh, the, we'll find a relation between beta here and alpha, in addition to the normalization which we had again. So let's do that. Do we differentiate this with respect to each and every pi, and we get our equations that look like this. This is what we had before, and now we have this other term, which does depend upon i. From the, and so, um, I just realized I have a mistake in here, which I'll fix. There should be a, a p of i there, right? Because we want to get the average, right? So there, there, I, I left out my little my P of I in that. I'll, I'll fix that. Um, probably not for this, but um, um, okay, we'll see how that goes. I'll see if I can fix that now. Okay, I'm back now and I corrected the small mistake I had. So let's see if I can figure out how to combine these things and get everything together. Well, we'll see if that works out in the end. Anyway, um, yeah, so now we're, we're, we're going to, um, uh, this was the yellow sign. So we're going to, we were considering the case of loaded dice. And we said, suppose we suspected that this wasn't a fair dice. And probably the simplest thing could be that there was some average value of the uh, face number that would come up after a, a large number of rolls. And that... Um, if we knew what that was, some value A that wasn't equal to 3.5, what 
you know, what were the, what are the, what should we take for the probabilities? What would be a good um, um, assumption for those probabilities just to take into account this extra information? And so we'll add that, uh, the way we accomplish that is to add another Lagrange uh, modifier, that is this term, and you could see that with if beta with uh, with beta were one here, right? That would that would set the average uh, some average value of the face number. That is the sum over the pi's of i times the pi's. So then, so we'll include this term and we'll play the same trick. We'll maximize this uncertainty. Um, uh, um, subject to the constraint of normalization, which is how we chose lambda the first time, uh, the, in the first example, and we'll choose beta. We'll see that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between what we take for beta and what we would get in that case for alpha once we solve for these probabilities. So we can do that. We get this equation. We have this extra term in this equation, and now we see that the pi's depend upon i, which is what we expect if we had something other than a, a fair dice, and the solution can be written this way. We can just solve this equation here, there. Now, um, which is, I'm just writing again on this slide. So the normalization, of course, tells us again the same thing, that the sum over the pi's has to equal 1. And so if we plug this in here, we'll see we get this equation for the normalization constraint. That is, this, this value, uh, uh, this term, so, so our probabilities have this form. They're this term times this term. And so this term, which gives a normalization, is 1 over the sum of these exponential factors, e to the beta i. And so this leaves, leaves us, as the probabilities, of course, uh, we just plugged, we plugged this into there, and we see that our pi's have to have this form. They have to be e to some beta i, where beta is our Lagrange multiplier, uh, and normalized by all the terms that have this form. So we could substitute 11 here into 9, which was the equation for the expectation value, right? We can substitute that in. I'm not going to do all the details, uh, but we can, we can substitute that in and require this term to be real and non-zero. We could call this e to the beta some, some uh, variable y, actually. And we'll see that uh, this equation 9 will give us a fifth order, order polynomial equation for y, which, you know, we have to solve numerically for this one. And we'll see that if a is between 1 and 6, which, only is, which is what makes sense, in fact, we'll only get one root from this fifth order, order polynomial equation, and then we can calculate the probabilities. That is, as I said, as we said before, for a given a, there's a unique value for this beta, or y, if you want to write it this way. And I've actually done that. I've actually done that in the next slide, and I've done that with some MATLAB code, and if you know, if you're really, really interested, I'd be happy to upload the code and you can play with it yourself. I'll show you some plots here in a minute. But the point is that, well, this solution might not actually give us the true PIs of this loaded dice because there's some flaw or intentional modification that gave that. But the point is, according to this principle of least bias, it's the most reasonable estimate we can make given the available information. In this case, that there was some average that was an average value of the face values uh, that, um, that were not um, three and a half. Hmm? And so we can look at this equation, by the way, and, and see what we expect for beta, for beta in certain limits, without solving it. So, of course, what, what values are the, are the pi's that should be capital pi and beta we expect if the dice is fair? Well, as a goes to, yeah. You know, 3.5 there. As what about when a goes to one? What about when a goes to six? Right. You can ask yourself those, and you'll see. You'll it will, we'll come back to this. But I solved this sum from values of a. And finally, and I'll, I'll plot these in the next slide. But why don't you think about this? Think about what you would get for pi's and beta in these different limits, or if it's fair. Well, if it's fair, it's quite easy. We've already solved that before, right? And if it's a fair dice, then of course beta would be equal zero. Um, in this limit, it's interesting to think about. 
But the, the other thing I want to point out, though, that's related to what we'll find later is that we could define this function by this, this thing that we normalized the probabilities by, this, this normalization this, in the denominator here, this sum. And we'll call that z of beta, because it, obviously it depends upon beta for this example. And it's equal to this sum. Um, and you'll see that, of course, if, if you can express the expectation A, which is the expect expectation of I, and this equation 9 back here, this equation, you can actually, the, the nice thing about writing this z, and we'll call this z a partition function, is you can see that the expectation of that is just, if this sum, you just take the derivative with respect to beta of the logarithm of this, and that'll go in the denominator, and this, we'll, you'll pull out the, uh, with you'll pull out the i's. You'll get exactly equation 9. So, we, so this z of beta is called the partition function, and we'll see that uh, in the, when we get to the so-called canonical ensemble for statistical mechanics. So it's not so mysterious, mysterious in this sense. We see how it works for um, this example. Right, so as I said, uh, we'll, we'll find similar re results for the canonical ensemble. And what will be interesting is this beta will actually be uh, the negative 1 over kBT because it's connected to the average energy of the system through an equation just like this. And that was the point of going through this example to show you that you can think you can actually work this out in a very simple situation. So here I worked out some examples. For example, I, I did this with MATLAB, and if you're interested, I'll post it. But for example, if I set A equal 2, then, and I solve for the probability distributions, I get this. Right? And I get, I get a certain beta, and that's what the probability distributions come out with. Of course, A equals 3.5. We have the uniform 1 over 6. And if A is 5.8, then we get this kind of probabilities. And you can do that. In fact, as I said, there's a one-to-one -one relation between beta and the average, this A. And it goes like this. So if, 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 uh, if A was, you know, 6, which means every time you roll the dice, you would have to get 6, then this beta has to be infinitely large. Uh, if, if beta, if A equals 1, then this beta has to be infinitely negatively large, right? Now, we could have used minus beta for a lot, a lot, Lagrange multiple instead. Uh, in fact, we could think of the die face number as some sort of energy, right? Huh. So, um, the problem with doing uh, lectures online is you need to turn off notifications like uh, alarms and things, which I, I'll have to do next time. Anyway, it, it, we, we could have called beta or minus beta. It doesn't matter. So let's, let's do this here uh, like this. And, and we would have gotten uh, where we had beta, we got minus beta. But let's just show what I mean by this. And, and now this starts to look like physics, actually. Suppose we have a system of, fi of n fixed constituents. Like, they're, they're atoms that have levels like R. And the average energy, we're, we're going to be interested in the average energy, like the total energy, which is capital U divided by N. So little u is the total energy of our system of N divided by N. What's the least bias estimate of the probabilities? Right? Assuming that all we know is we have some average energy, little u. So let's just write that out explicitly. The available state states that each, each of the n constituents can have, or have these energies 1, 2, 3, 4, like our dice. We're just going to call them, instead of you know, 1, 2, 3, up to 6, or r, we're going to say that we're going to label them as energies. And so again, we we'll want to maximize this, um, this term. Again, I left out the p of i here. You'll have to put that in yourself because uh, I'll have to do this recording, finish this recording today sometime. There's a P of I there. And we do the same trick, just like we did with the dice. Normalization and uh, average energy, which is this. And we have this, we introduce our Lagrange multiplier. I only just use a minus sign here just for, for convenience. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But uh, it, it'll look more normal if we do that. And so, once again, we have this equation for the, we, for the probabilities, and we solve this, and we see that the pi's are e to the minus beta epsilon sub i over this sum. And we identify this partition function. And we'll see that the average energy can be 
arrived from this uh, partial derivative by direct. Just just uh, you know, put plug this in and do the derivative yourself. You know, you'll see that. And so this actually is sort of one way to get to what's called the canonical ensemble. This is the sort of modern um, information theoretic approach. But I think it's very, very interesting So because it, it sort of shows you a different way to think about uh, statistical mechanics and statistical physics. Now, we'll, we'll derive the canonical ensemble in the traditional way um, in the next lecture or two, or maybe, maybe this, uh, another lecture by the end of this week. Okay, I just wanted to, uh, I just made, corrected the same mistake I had in, in the other slide. Uh, I'm just going to add this at the end of this. I, I just corrected that. This little PI should be there. And so, um, and also what I'll do is I will uh, try to, I'll upload this file with uh, narration, this lecture, and I'll also upload a PDF version of the uh, lectures as I normally do onto Moodle. Okay. Uh, see you next time, next lecture.